My wife cheated on me with a guy almost the same age as our son, so I planned a huge revenge. I completely cut her off, disappeared from her life like Houdini after 23 years of marriage. But what she did in response made things even darker. Here's what happened. She decided to blow up our marriage and ruin the home we built for this guy, a pretty boy with a soft side. She responded saying pretty much the same thing she said when they last talked that she loves him and enjoyed their time together, but she can't lose me. I'm still the love of her life, but she'll always have a place for him in her heart. They can still be friends if he chooses, but the physical relationship between them is over. He begged her to see him one last time, and yep, you've guessed it, she said yes. One more for the road, right? Who am I to judge? That's what I did to her the previous night. Of course, I added all of that to the archive I'd compiled. December 4th marked the beginning of Phase 3, the final phase of Operation Shinobi. The divorce papers were in hand, my new place was set up, and now I had to start slowly moving my stuff out of the house. But first, I had to tell my sons. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office, and laid everything on the table. Not the specifics, but that their mother had been unfaithful for over a year, and I was going to file for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially upset by this because he had just experienced his first taste of betrayal. Yup, his first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Seeing his heart broken again at the idea that his own mother could do this hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better and suggested taking his brother in to live with him until this blew over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff, and he asked me if I was going to be okay. I told him, Yes, son, I'm going to be all right, and so are you. We are going to be all right. I promise. And then they left. The hardest part was now over, and it was time to arm the nukes. Over the next few weeks, day by day, Leo helped me get a little of my most sensitive stuff out of the house. I gave him a list of all the definite stuff to grab while Helen and I were at work and left him the spare key. This was all stuff Helen wouldn't notice was missing until she was told it was gone. I'd also gotten a new phone and a new phone number and told everyone who needed to know Leo, Jake, Emma, my son's big sister, and my mother my new contact information. Meanwhile, I kept up the act with Helen, and she had no clue trickling bits and pieces of affection to her just to keep her off the trail while she was still in contact with Adam. Not to the extent that they had been before, but there was still an emotional connection. The fog was faint, but it was still there. All the while, I gathered everything and I do mean everything. Every bit of data that I'd archived since I started the plan. Call logs, texts, pictures, emails, everything and began making printouts. Folks, I must have spent over $1,500 on office supplies, printer ink, paper, binders, the works, and I organized everything in order from the beginning of the affair until two weeks ago, December 16th. All went into the binders, 14 of them. I then put each one in a box, gift-wrapped each, addressing them to various people. My mother, my father, he had passed away seven years ago, her parents, her two sisters, her brother, her HR department did I forget to mention that Adam works for the same company and there's a strict rule against inter-company relationships because of what she does. Several of her friends, Adam and Adam's parents. I lugged all of those things to the post office and shipped them all out on December 16th, either for delivery December 22nd to 24th. Perfect. So now we're at Christmas Eve. Helen comes home around the usual time, no idea if she'd seen Adam. I'd stopped tracking her on the app the 18th. I figured I'd gotten all the mileage I needed from it. As usual, she showers, hangs out with me for a bit. I blow her back out on the living room couch, and she turns in for the night. The final phase was upon me at long last. The nuke I'd been arming since June was finally about to be launched. In the middle of the night, I woke up and wrapped three of the remaining binders with the divorce papers taped to the inside cover and set them on my side of the bed with a note that said, Merry Christmas on it. Next to it, I left my old phone and the business card of my lawyer. I packed up the remainder of my most needed items enough to fill two backpacks and I left my home that I'd spent 23 years in for the last time. That, my friends, was one week ago. 
to Helen. I am completely off the grid. Gone. Shadow ghosted. She's blocked on Facebook, but hasn't blocked me for some reason. So I'm keeping tabs on the fallout. It's absolutely glorious. My packages have reached everyone I sent them to, and Helen is getting crucified. Her youngest sister completely dressed her down. Both of her parents have condemned her. My mom absolutely destroyed her. My holy smokes. I know my mom has a mean streak, but the things she called Helen were unholy. She's been frantically trying to find out if anyone knows where I am, but those that do aren't saying a word. All over her Facebook feed, she's desperately trying to reach me because I'm guessing she knows I'm likely watching, but I'm not saying a word to her without my lawyer present. That'll be the next time I share oxygen with her. She has no way of spinning the story to make me the bad guy because I have exposed her to everyone who matters to her. And from what a mutual friend who works in the same company as her told me, she and Adam apparently are being put on administrative leave as of tomorrow. So, yeah, chances are she'll be going into the next year unemployed. As for the final two binders, well, one has been turned over to my lawyer as my final bit of evidence for the impending divorce. And the last one I put in my storage unit to be burned in Jake's fire pit when the divorce is final. Do I feel guilty about this? No, not even a little bit. For 23 years, I did right by this woman. I gave her the home she wanted. I gave her the family she wanted. I gave her the life I thought we both deserved, and I loved her unconditionally. Never did I falter. Never did I stray. Never did I even think about breaking my vows. When an issue came up that I thought was affecting our marriage, I came to her and told her, and we sorted it out best we could. She chose to find comfort in another man's bed rather than come to me and say that she was unhappy with our bedroom life at the time. She decided to step out with a young punk who gave her the tingles, so no, I have no sympathy for what I did or for her. She can burn in hell for all I care. The most I stand to lose is my house, a car, and maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in alimony. But seeing as the divorce is filed under the statute of adultery and New York State isn't at fault, that might end up getting waived with the overwhelming amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me and I'm never looking back. Jumping into the future, there is an update. Christmas Day was the first full day I spent in my new apartment. It's still a work in progress as I have more stuff I want to get. But overall, I've made it my home since I'm going to be here for at least two years. My sons and the eldest girlfriend came over and spent a good portion of the day with me. The girlfriend brought over treats she'd made and also whipped up a really nice meal. I got to sit and talk with my sons in a way that I hadn't done in a really long time, and it was nice. My big sister also came over with more goodies and hung out with us. It had been the first time she'd seen her nephews in nearly a year. Having all of them around did me some real good. If I were by myself, I think I would have just drunk myself into a stupor. Everyone cleared out around eight-ish, and I decided I wanted to go hang out with Jake and his wife, Claudia. Hung out with them for a couple of hours, had a couple of drinks, and then went back home. The next big development that happened was last week. Around midday, I got a text from Emma asking if I was busy that night. I, of course, wasn't. So we agreed to meet up after I got off work. She showed up, and we went to a dinner not far from where I work here in New York City. We're doing indoor dining at 25% capacity thanks to the Rona. But there's mostly no trouble getting seats because so many of us choose not to dine out as much these days anyway. So, after we're seated and order our food, Emma pretty much laid all of her cards on the table. And honestly, I knew this was coming. She basically confessed that she's liked me all the way back since we were teenagers, but never got the chance to tell me since Helen swooped in and took me before she could. For context, I've known Emma longer than Helen by two years. As I mentioned, she's been one of my closest friends, along with Leo and Jake. We were the social outcasts in high school, the raver kids who didn't fit into all the other cliques. Back then, Emma had a weight problem and was diabetic. She was the heavyset goth chick who was super cool, but no guy would ever give a second glance at her. But we always had chemistry. These days, Emma is a personal trainer and a yoga instructor. She was the ugly duckling who grew up into one hell of a beautiful swan, if I must say. Long story short, 
we decided that upon the finalization of my divorce, we are going to start seeing each other. And yet, I slept with her that night, took her back to my new place, and we had a grand old time. Am I ashamed of sleeping with her? Heck no. Emma's been a better friend to me than Helen ever was. That's not saying Helen wasn't my best friend, but for nearly a quarter of a century, I've known Emma, and she's always supported me, even so much as I learned that day. Willingly taking a step back from her own feelings to allow me to pursue and eventually start a life with Helen, that resonated with me on a level I didn't think it would. That kind of selflessness towards another person is the definition of real love. I know it sounds like I'm just trying to justify in my head that sleeping with her was the right decision. To me, it was, and I plan on exploring what's to come with Emma and I with total commitment. Okay, on to yesterday, the day I met my wife and her lawyer to discuss the divorce. It's now been two weeks since I cut off my soon-to-be ex-wife. This past Monday, I got a phone call that Helen's attorney had scheduled a meeting for us to discuss the terms of our divorce, which was yesterday. I met with him Tuesday morning to discuss the terms I wanted. Long story short, it's an uncontested divorce on the grounds of marital neglect from Helen. My terms are a full division of assets and me selling my half of the house ownership to her. She can have it. We keep our respective vehicles. I keep my cabin, and under the claim of marital neglect, she gets no spousal support from me. As for my 17-year-old son, he's free to choose who he wants to live with following the divorce, which will most likely be me. So Wednesday comes, and I show up to my lawyer's office dressed in my Johnny Cash best. My wife and her lawyer show up, and she looks terrible, barely holding it together. I give her the stone face. I won't bore you with the legal talk but her lawyer presented an offer for reconciliation. I shot them down almost as soon as she finished listing the details of the request. Like I said, I'll spare you all the details of the meeting. Long story short, we agree to a legal separation leading to an uncontested divorce. The only change is that I will pay her dollar $653 a month of temporary spousal support to cover the cost of utilities until she's gainfully employed again. Yep, she got fired for her relationship with Adam. He got fired too. Up to a full year after the finalization, I make enough that it won't hurt me financially, even if she takes her time finding a new job. And she's got enough in her savings to live off of for quite some time. Once a full year has passed after the finalization date of the divorce, she's on her own. A small price to pay to be rid of her and her cheating. It'll take roughly three months for things to go through so by early April, I'll be free of her. So after the meeting, my lawyer gives me some final words before telling me he'll be in touch to update me on the progress of the filing. Back out on the street, Helen chases me down and asks if we can talk. I figured I'd at least give her that. She held it together fairly well in the meeting, but outside, let the tears flow. Seeing how sorry she was and how she never meant for it to go as far as it did, she says she never expected to fall in love with Adam, but knew when she thought I was cheating how wrong it was to betray her own husband in such a way. She asked if I could ever find it in my heart to forgive her, and that maybe in a few years we could try to start over, that she can't imagine what her life is going to be without me. I tell her, start imagining it soon because this will be the last time I ever speak to or see you. I tell her that 17 is almost a man and old enough to make his own choices as to his own future. I say that I gave her half of my life and every ounce of love that I had unconditionally, and she, in her own words, fell in love with another man. That there is absolutely no chance of me forgiving her. That all the love I had for her was slowly killed all those months when she confided and professed her love to Adam rather than coming to me and telling me she had any issues with how things were going with us. I told her I loved who she once was, but I hate who stands before me, and that if I never see her again, it'll be too soon. Here we are on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan, her making a scene, crying her eyes out. A couple of people walk by and give side glances, but at that point, I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly humiliate her, I pretty much already socially and professionally destroyed her, but I needed to get the last bit of emotion I had for her out. I finished by telling her that I didn't regret the 23 years I spent being her husband. 
I regretted that in 23 years, she decided the easy way out was the better option, and that for 23 years I thought she was mine. But it turned out it was just my turn. I put in my earphones, turned around, and walked away. Later that night, her father calls me and apologizes. He praises me for always being a good man to his daughter and tells me that he's ashamed of her and that he raised her better than what she did. I'm not going to lie, I'm going to miss the old man. My dad died years ago, so he's always been my default father figure since. But I can't see myself maintaining a relationship with anyone on her side of the family. After that call, I went on Facebook and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. Yeah, it's not final yet, but in my eyes, it's over and done. Like I said, when I make a post on Facebook, it's an event, so plenty of folks started hitting me up over Messenger, asking me questions, and I laid it all out. I laid it all out that I filed for divorce with Helen earlier in the day. Of course, Emma called me, shocked that I had pulled the trigger so fast. Obviously, I was already in the process of it when we spoke, but she had no way of knowing how far it was along. I asked her if she could come over, and of course, she came running. We slept together again but this time she stayed the night. We laid in my bed and talked until the early hours of the morning, and I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in a really long time. Emma gets me, and I can't get enough of being around her. Since the day she confided in me, she's all that's been on my mind. Yeah, I know some folks are going to say it's messed up that I moved on so fast, but as far as I'm concerned, my marriage ended the day Adam let Helen touch him, so I'm about due. So yeah, that's it. That's the end. My divorce is in the works, and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Emma. I know what a common response to someone is. I said I'd probably never marry again, but that was before Emma came clean to me about how she felt towards me, and I can't deny that I feel the same. We're going to take it slow, and we're not announcing anything until the divorce with Helen is legal and official. As for Helen, I couldn't care less what happens to her. She could move Adam into our old home for all I care. I'll be getting my money for the house over the course of the next year in four quarterly installments, and aside from the dollar six hundred fifty-three, I will pay out directly to her savings account monthly. I never have to see or speak to her again. Jumping into the future, there is an update. My soon-to-be ex-wife of twenty-three years just tried to end it last night. The quick version of the backstory is I discovered my wife of 23 years was having an affair with a 27-year-old co-worker. We have two sons, 22 and 17. I came up with a plan to completely turn her life upside down, centered around fooling her into thinking that I was having an affair myself. I kept the act going for over four and a half months while gathering evidence of her cheating, as well as securing divorce papers and planning my exit strategies, slowly moving my personal belongings from our home to a new apartment, getting a new phone and number, separating my half of our shared income from our joint accounts, etc. I gathered every bit of proof about her affair, compiled it, printed it all out from the very start to that week, filed it into 14 binders, packed 11 into gift-wrapped boxes, and mailed them to the most important people in her life as well as her HR department so that they would all arrive on Christmas Eve. While she slept, I took one of the remaining three binders and did the same. Only this one. I taped the divorce notice to the inside cover and left it on my side of the bed, which, mind you, she's had her lover on any number of times, along with my old phone and my lawyer's business card, and then cut her off completely. Then we went through all the divorce proceedings. This brings us to last night, as only my closest friends, two sons, older sister, and mother have my new contact information. I've completely blocked my soon-to-be ex-wife on all social outlets, so she has no way of reaching me since I left her on Christmas Eve. But some of our mutual friends still do. Last night, I'm hanging out in my apartment and I get a voice call notification on Messenger from one of those friends, one of the few who hadn't abandoned her after I exposed her affair. She didn't waste any time when I answered and said she had gone to check on Helen, my soon-to-be ex-wife, and found her passed out in the bedroom, foaming at the mouth, with two bottles of empty pills next to her. She's in the IQ in critical but stable condition. The doctor said that she will likely pull through, but she's clearly not going to be well after. 
She begged and pleaded for me to come. Her parents and two of her sisters were also there at the hospital. My guess is they were notified after the hospital tried to contact me, but Helen would still have my old number as her emergency contact. I simply told her, no, Helen is not my problem anymore. She had clearly decided she wanted to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. I then told her friend that if Helen's family were there, they could help her sort out the pieces. But as far as Helen and I are concerned, there is no Helen and I anymore. I then ended the call. I've had a few hours to sleep on it, and my sons called me this morning asking if I knew. I told them yes, but I also let them know that if they want to be there and be supportive of their mother, I will not hold it against them or judge them for it. She is their mother after all, but I myself washed my hands of her and care little to nothing about what she does for or to herself anymore. They were both a little taken aback by this, but respected my stance. However, now that the news has broken about her attempt, many of those friends who dropped her are all starting to come back and saying that I needed to be there for her. That even despite what she did to me, I need to support her in her time of need. I've also been told that her affair partner tried to visit her this morning, but wasn't allowed because he's not family. I'm getting pressured to go see her, but I feel nothing for this woman anymore. I haven't for a very long time. I checked out during the process of getting my revenge for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact, it makes me hate her even more. She's the one who is unfaithful. She's the one who thought a year-long fling with a guy five years older than her oldest son was worth destroying 23 years. And now that she has to face the consequences of her choices, she chooses the most selfish way to deal with it. Even now, seeing as she is likely going to survive, she's gotten immediate sympathy from everyone who took her to task. And I'm being made out to look like the jaded ex-husband unwilling to sympathize with her by most of her family, not her dad. He's reached out to me over the last few hours and said he respects my decision to stay away. It's like I never even truly knew this woman. 23 years and it comes down to this. Yes, I know the way I broke things off with her may have put her in a poor mental state. But now a whole new can of worms has been opened up because either she had a complete mental breakdown and decided to end her life, or she made an extremely risky and calculated move to gain favor back from people who just weeks before condemned her for betraying me. She cheated on me, and now she's the victim. Sorry if this comes off as rantish, but I'm here trying to wrap my brain around this. I want to be perfectly clear I am not going to visit Helen. She gave up her right to me caring about her well-being the day that she let Adam be with her. This might come off as heartless because despite the calm, collected way I've been throughout my whole ordeal, my feelings are still very much raw. But I don't care about this woman. I haven't for a long time. I'm aware that I'm going to be seen as the bad guy by a number of folks here. I don't care much. Think of me however you want. If you were in my shoes, you'd see her actions very differently. Some of you folks are going to look up my story and see what I did to her. And you're going to draw the conclusion that this was all my fault. That me tormenting her for all those months, fooling her into thinking that I was cheating on her while she actively cheated on me, then destroying her socially and professionally was the cause of her meltdown. Maybe it was. Maybe I'm a heartless sociopath. But as Arthur Fleck so famously said, you get what you deserve. I gave this woman half of my life and did absolutely everything to be the best possible husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no influence on her decision to step outside of our marriage. She did it, quote, for herself. Her selfishness knows no bounds, and I'm glad to be rid of her. If it makes me the bad guy because I will not go in and see her and never plan on interacting with her ever again, so be it. I hold true to my beliefs. She made the choice to betray me. She made the choice to put her needs above the needs of our marriage. So now it's my turn to choose me over everything else. She can rot in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help fix her. My obligation to ever care about her well-being ended the day we signed the separation agreement. I just needed to get this off my chest. If you're going to judge me for feeling how I feel, save it. Like I said above, after 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman at all. I have no sympathy for her, and I never will. Let her rot. Jumping into the future, there is one final update. 
I've been informed by Helen's dad that she's been moved from the IQ to the mental health wing. Doctors are still watching her mental state. She's conscious and aware again, but obviously very tired. Her father told me she asked if I came to see her, and he said no, and she shut down after. He respectfully said any further news he'll share only if I ask because he understands the headspace I'm in. Also, I've scheduled counselling for my 17-year-old son. The first consultation is coming this Monday. The way that the original poster describes Helen at the end does make it sound like this was the second of his theories that she planned this whole thing as one way to get him back into her life because, as she said herself, she can't imagine life without him. You can never really know what somebody's motivation for doing something like this is. But I can't possibly believe that she thinks doing this would somehow make him come to her and forgive her for everything that she did to him, which is why I think that's most likely not the real reason she did this, unless she is just totally delusional or doesn't understand the depths of the original poster's anger and pain from this whole situation. And going back to the original way this whole story was described, Part of his main plan was to try and make it seem like he was the one cheating in order to plant the seeds of mistrust or dissonance between Adam and Helen. But even after all that planning and all that setup, in the end, it sounds like Adam still wants to be with Helen. Despite all of the original poster's efforts, him showing up to the hospital after all this doesn't necessarily say that, but the part where he goes full soap opera on her and tells her that he's in love with her and he has to be with her and all of that even after all of the original poster's plans were already in motion, does make it seem like that. So there's a chance that she ends up with him in the end anyway. The original poster makes it pretty clear that he doesn't care anymore, even if she moved Adam into their old house. So now that you know everything, was the revenge justified or was it going too far? What do you think?